Hello and welcome to a Trib Talk Town Hall. I'm Jennifer Napier Pierce, Executive Editor of the Salt Lake Tribune. By now, we're all too familiar with the catalog of individuals killed at the hands of police, from Eric Garner and Trayvon Martin to Breonna Taylor and Bernardo Palacios Carvajal, closer to home. And of course, the death of George Floyd. The viral video of Floyd's senseless killing on Memorial Day has sparked protests here in Utah and around the world as demonstrators have raised a collective call for accountability and for change. We here at the Salt Lake Tribune are hoping to provide some context to the current social unrest and to bring some critical diverse voices to the fore. So we're hosting a series of town hall events over the next few weeks and we're kicking it off tonight with a frank open and sincere conversation about racism here in Utah. And joining me is James Jackson III. He is founder and executive director of the Utah Black Chamber, born and raised here in Utah. James, it's good to see you again. Thanks for having me, Jennifer, appreciate it. Also with us, William A. Smith. He's a professor of ethnic studies and the department chair of education, culture and society at the University of Utah. Professor Smith, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Also, Saida Dahir, she is a poet and activist, a rising sophomore at the University of California, Berkeley, and she's also a refugee from Somalia who grew up here in Utah. Uh, Saida, it's nice to have you. Thank you for having me. And we also have John Mejia. He is legal director of ACLU Utah, also grew up here in the Beehive State. John, thank you so much for your time. Happy to be here. And we're going to take your questions and stories as well. Have you encountered racism on the job or in your neighborhood? Have you spoken out against racism? And what did that uh, feel like? I'm very interested in hearing lived experiences for the next hour. So send those to the hashtag trip talk and we'll get to some of those as we can. Before we get into your personal stories, I just want to get a, a sense of the pulse of the protests that have been going on every day for the past week and a half here in Utah. I, I'd love to hear your observations and your impressions of what you're seeing out there. Uh, let's start with you, Professor Smith. Well, uh, as far as my pulse of what's going on, I, to me personally, this has been brewing under the surface for a long time. We've been sending signals, messages. We've done as many studies as you can count, you know, um, to warn people that this was inevitable. Uh, people are tired, people are fed up. Um, there's frustration, they feel unheard. And there's a problem that we have to address. And hopefully we can address this finally, get it over with and move on. Um, when we talk about our experiences, um, even here in Utah, I'll be happy to share mine. I was welcomed to Salt Lake City with two harassment cases by the police. So just let me know when you're ready to hear those stories. <laughs> uh, we will absolutely get to that um, because I, I do want to make this as much academic as personal. Um, Saida, um, you've been out on the streets. What are you seeing? What are you feeling? What are people I'm telling you as you protest. Yeah, so I've been um, pretty much every every day out protesting with a bunch of people. The turnout is amazing. Um, I've really never seen anything like this before in my life. I remember I was only like a preteen um, when the Trayvon Martin shootings happened and the Eric Gardner shootings happened. And um, I was there, I was out in the streets when those two people were killed by um, the police as well. Um, but there was nothing like this. There was no crowds, there was no huge worldwide movement. So it's been really, really beautiful to see the, the, that everyone is finally catching on. Everyone is finally getting a glimpse of the racial inequalities and injustice in, in Utah and all around the world and finally using their voice collectively to do something about it. John, do, does this feel different to you? Yeah, I, I likewise have not seen such a sustained interest in getting out into the street and making your voice heard. And, you know, it really does feel like a moment where real change is possible if we're able to grab it. And I, I think people being out really reflects wanting to do something different than we've been doing. 
Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this is, this is not like anything I've ever seen. Hmm. And James, you said that the, your inbox is just overflowing. You have a lot of requests about people who, who are interested in talking about reality, about racism, about some really hard issues. Um, and have you seen that before? No. Uh, in the 11 years now that the chamber has been operating here in Utah, this is probably the busiest week of ever that we've ever had. And not only just from the business perspective, but, you know, so many people wanting to learn how to become an ally. How can I help? Where can I donate? Where can I contribute my time? Um, and it's just so overwhelming for us, but at the same time, so re um, great and incredible to see so many people that are finally speaking out um, that aren't even non-Black and just saying, hey, I'm ready. Um, it's time for a change. And that's, and so we're just kind of, We've been such in a reactive state right now, trying to handle all the phone calls and people becoming a member of the chamber um, from black to non-black, from business to non-business, just wanting to put in their efforts and, and you know, continue our mission um, just to elevate just the black community overall here in Utah. So that's just been just uh, truly great to see right now. Hmm. Um, we, of course, live in Utah. Something like 80% of the state's population is white. Um, what is it like living while black or living while brown here in Utah? Um, you got to share your story, Professor, about your introduction to this state. Well, I've been here 21 years. I came in 1999. Within my first semester here at the University of Utah, I lived on 11th East, just down from East High. So for those people who know that area. And my first encounter was just trying to make a left-hand turn at the stop sign uh, to go down uh, for South. And the police were trying to intimidate me from making that turn. And so I would stop and they would inch up a little bit as if they were gonna let me go. And I'd start to turn and they inch up a little bit to block me from going. And then they just looked at me driving by and stared at me. And so that was like my first welcome to Salt Lake City. The second one, I have a colleague, Dr. Audrey Thompson, who's a, a white female. We went to graduate school together. And she was just trying to see what my transition to Salt Lake City and to the department was like. And so we had breakfast together and it was downtown. and. I said afterwards, um, well, how are you getting home? She said, oh, I'm just gonna walk. I said, well, I'll, I'll drop you off. She lives up by the Capitol. So as I'm driving her home, uh, I notice a car, a police car following us for about a couple of miles. And so as every black person is trained to do, I put both my hands on the steering wheel. And so I'm driving and Audrey's talking and I pull over to where she lives. And then that's when I tell her, I said, Audrey, the police have been following us. Now they're out of their car. The one on my side has his gun out. The one on your side has his hand on the gun. Audrey's an anti-racist activist and she thought that she could use her whiteness to defuse the situation. So she jumps out the car. And so at that moment, I'm thinking I'm gonna catch a bullet in my head because a white woman jumping out of a black man's car when one police officer already has his gun drawn, right? but she thought she could defuse that moment. But the, the thing that happened next was so interesting. She said, what's the matter, officer? She, they said, are you all right? She said, yes. What's the matter? What's the problem? Ma'am, are you all right? They said it four times. And she said, look, I'm Dr. Aubrey Thompson. That's Dr. William Smith. He was just dropping me off at my home. And they said, well, we noticed he parked a little far from the curb. I was only about 10 inches from the curb. So she knew at that moment that it was a bogus stop and that it was harassment. But she had a hoodie over her head. So she thinks that they didn't know that she might have been a white woman, but they could see me until she jumped out. And then the interesting thing was once they let us go, and she went into her house. I go up the hill, I make a right-hand turn where the Capitol is, and I go down where the conference center is to make a left. They followed me all the way down that street before they made a U-turn and went back up the hill. So two incidents 
in one semester was my welcome to Salt Lake City. Now, I'm not suggesting that Salt Lake City is any different than any other city in America. I come from Chicago and I've had experiences there as well, but it's too much of a similar experience, particularly for black men. Mm. John, you grew up here. Um, what was that like? I mean, was there a moment where you realized you were different from your peers? Well, you know, I, I think the thing about growing up in Salt Lake is people think, you know, they're very well-meaning. And I think that a lot of people have uh, a hard time, you know, accepting, like hearing the story that the professor told. And, you know, a lot of the people that I grew up with would think, well, they had a good reason to suspect you, right? It's just this, this people can be in a position where, you know, they, they can't sort of accept that maybe the fact that, you know, that happened had some, some problem behind it. You know, they want to give the benefit of the doubt to the person who is conducting the stop, who is wielding the power. And so it's just sort of, you know, I, I don't think it's a universal experience with everybody that I grew up with, but there are a lot of people that you grow up with that just can't conceive that somebody in a powerful position like that might harbor those, those feelings about people. And I think, you know, being part of a family, you know, a Latino family, you, you know, you can see that, I, you know, I can see that, I, you know, as the, you know, in my, in my position, I see that every day, you know, you hear stories every day about people who have had a bad experience like that. And you know, that the, the people in power, for the most part, or, you know, that's, a, that's a generalization, but, you know, a lot of the people in power don't want to see that. And I think that's what's you know important about this moment is I think a lot of people are becoming more willing to open up their eyes and open up their minds. Yeah. Saida, what was it like growing up in Utah? Yes, so my experience is a little different because my family came here as refugees from Somalia. Um, and although we are very grateful and I'm very grateful for the opportunity of like life, liberty and education here, there's definitely, um, a different way that the world around us thinks of the United States that is a complete facade. Uh, when I was back in Africa, everyone used to talk about the American dream, you know, Hollywood, they would generalize America, like money grew on trees here. Uh, that's obviously not the case, you know, my family still gets calls from back home and people just automatically assume that life is easier or better here. But being black, it doesn't matter that I'm a refugee. It doesn't matter that I'm African. Um, if a cop sees me, I'm black. It doesn't matter if they know that I'm from a different country. So it's very, um, it was jarring to just grow up here. And uh, a particular instance where it was kind of a wake up call is um, me and my sisters, we one day were gonna go to um, our school dance. So we were completely dressed up, wore our dresses, um, completely um, became princesses in sort. Um, and we got in the car and we started driving to the school dance um, and we got pulled over by a police officer. Uh, and then four other police officer uh, cars came. Uh, we had to line up against the wall and there was a misunderstanding about the car. And uh, two days later, we found out that like there was a, a robbery. So they might've assumed that it was us, but imagine just four girls in gowns and dresses being pulled over by the police for um, officer cars, lights were everywhere. And I was only like 14 years old. And all of us were so terrified because we know what happens. You move a little too quickly. You reach for something too quickly. You know, you back up, you turn around. There's so many instances where um, things can just change like that. Uh, so we really woke up and we're like, the people we're fighting for, the hashtag we're fighting for um, in, in states that are not even ours could be us any day. Uh, so it was very jarring, but uh, I think that the, the refugee community in Utah has dealt with a lot of racism. Uh, I grew up getting bullied very badly for being different. Uh, going to school with all white kids up till high school, it, it really shows you that there's, there's things that we need to talk to our, our kids about, about racism, about how to treat um, different people, about how to treat people of color because at such a young age in elementary school, you like lay the foundations of race for your whole life. And it's really hard to change once you grow up but you can do it definitely.
Hmm. James, I, I, something that Professor Smith and, and now that Saida just said about conversations, about how to keep safe, putting both hands on the steering wheel. What are the conversations that you had with your parents growing up here in Utah? You know, it was fascinating because I think, you know, I'm actually biracial. So my mom is Hispanic and my dad is black. And, you know, growing up, I don't think my my parents really, um, they kind of gave me just a quick little summary that things are going to be different. But I don't think I really listened really well because I felt, you know, growing up that I'll, I'll, I'll be okay. Of course, I had some, um, you know, racist names called to me when I was younger and, and I grew up pretty shy and passive and, you know, sometimes, a lot of times naive um, to the fact because I thought everybody here would be friendly, but I'll never forget the time, well, it was two times, you know, driving back with some friends um, from Las Vegas and, you know, halfway home getting pulled over, you know, even though I was doing the speed limit, just being pulled over um, just because we we're, we're mainly just got up out of our out of our beds and just left, right? So we're not looking or dressed um, as, you know, professionally, you know, pretty much looked like we were out of bed as college students back in the day. But this being pulled over and both times that we were pulled over, my car was searched. And, you know, at the time I had a little two-seater coupe and it shouldn't take an hour to search my car saying that there's drug, you know, this is a big high drug trafficking area. Um, and that was pretty frustrating. And I, and I just kind of sat back because I didn't want to cause any type of trouble. And then um, later in life, as I grew older, I thought everything is all good. And we, um, my girlfriend at the time, now fiance, lived, we lived up in Cottonwood Heights. And there was a time when she was pulled over and I was in the passenger seat. Um, and they asked for my driver's license. Not really understanding why they would ask for my driver's license. But, and Michelle was trying to respond back to them, trying to ask questions, but I just complied and just gave him my license. I said, just, just let it go. We'll just kind of deal with it. And when he went back, we looked back and there's four other cop cars um, behind us. And that was, I was like, are these cops bored? Like I said, my naivety takes over, but it was, it was those times that just, you know, kind of get frustrating and just realize that I'm black and these are the things that I have to go through and, and deal with um, all the time. Mm. Uh, so the state, of course, we know that Black people came with the Mormon pioneers before statehood. Um, but one thing that I did not learn in high school was that the Utah Territory was a slave state from 1852 to 1862. Are there other things like that in our state's history that Utahns should know about? Um, James? Yeah, um, I think one people things that people should realize is that there are black people here before the pioneers came you know there there was james beckworth up in the cache valley who was a fur trapper um he, he was here long before uh, the slaves even came um and then early when you know during the early 1900s we had our own little ecosystem here with the railroad and with the uh air force base so we had our own hotels and porters and waiters clubs um, here that we had our own little businesses, you know, during the segregated times. And so we, there was a pretty uh, lively um, black culture here up in the, in the Ogden area. And I feel like Dr. Smith, you're with uh, doc, you know, you was doc with Dr. Coleman, worked with him a lot, and you have probably some more history to add to that as well. Well, I don't think I can add much uh, more to what you said. I think it's important. What I could add to is what you talked about being stopped by the police. There was a study in 2018 by Alexi Jones, and she sh and it was on New York City, and she showed that blacks were eight times more likely than whites to be stopped by the police, and 11 times more likely than whites to be frisked by the police. She also showed that out of the police stops, they reported using force in 23% of the cases of stopping black people, uh, black actually black and Latino residents, and then 16% of those stops were only uh, frisking white people, or really stopping white people. So Latino and black people were much more likely to be stopped by the police and use force upon them than white residents. So we, we see that, and that data kind of mirrors what's going on across the country. 
Absolutely. We, we're we also hearing a lot about institutional racism during the protests. And certainly much of that is focused on law enforcement, but there are other institutions that we're all part of where racism manifests itself. Um, uh, Professor, you've dedicated a lot of research to that, uh, particularly in schools and higher ed. Yeah. Well, one study that um, we did was a national study. It's called I have to look it up. You make me want to holler and throw up both my hands. It was a study we published in 2016. And what we saw, and this was on college campuses, so at Harvard, Michigan, Michigan State, University of Illinois, UC Berkeley, Stanford, and a couple other schools. And we were looking at Black um, male students at that time. And one of the overriding findings that we had was that they were constantly being um, accosted by the police just for being a student. So their presence on the campus was a threat that people would see them just walking and call the police. So all these things that we've been seeing on the news lately about people calling the police on black people just acting normal, that's what's going on on college campuses. So they couldn't even um, just be a student without the threat and the pressure of the police being called on them. And, they, and they're being hemmed up against the wall, um, patted down and asked, have you stole something? They said, well, I haven't even been anywhere, I'm walking, right? Or I've, we heard that a purse was stolen several blocks um, uh, away, but they say, you saw me coming from the opposite direction. <laughs> so, so all of these different things, you, you can see those testimonies in that paper about at what we call some of our most elite institutions, black men having the same experiences. And so overwhelmingly, black males are constantly um, being encountered by the police and it's, it tends to be something very negative. And that's a threat to their ability to succeed successfully, to integrate into the school. And what it does is it raises their racial battle fatigue and that's energy that's redirected from being a student and learning to cope with racism, to find strategies to deal with that. And we see the same thing in our studies on uh, Latinx students, so Latinas and Latinos. So these campuses are struggling to really deal with race. And it's the same struggle that they've been dealing with for, for you know, decades. Mm. Uh, Saida, that's exactly where you are. You you live on a college campus. Um, do you get tired? Are are you experiencing the fatigue that um, uh, Professor Smith has been talking about? Oh yes, um, especially uh, I know for a fact when I I went to Berkeley, but my siblings all went to the University of Utah, and it's like. I can talk to them and I can say, hey, this happened and the same things probably happened at their college campus or even halfway across the country. If I talk to a random person, they probably experienced it. And I think right now there's a dialogue of institutions being um, fake woke or being fake inclusive. We see a lot of institutions that have been post posting supporting Black Lives Matter, but still I know Berkeley, there's only 3% Black students. Um, and there's um, at the University of Utah, there's a huge climate change um, that needs to be change when students of color and black students walk down the hallway and they see you know kkk symbols or um events that are a uh, hate uh, hate speech is happening and i know at berkeley we have a huge free speech movement and of course there's a fine line between free speech and, and hate speech and you know as students especially as black students it's very tiring and it's very tiresome to know that your institution is not is not backing up the black community like they say they are you know on paper they can look like they're diverse on paper they can look like they support the black community but when it comes to outreaches outreaching to high schools that are in low communities and getting new students from there or admitting more black students or allowing more financial aid for people of colors um it's not there you know it's all bark and no bite so i think right now there's a huge shift in 
more and more people becoming mobilized about institutional racism and combating uh, institutions and asking for affirmative action again. I know that's something that uh, the UC system completely abolished, but affirmative action does work and it helps a lot of people get to places in huge institutions that have been anti-Black and have really shunned Black people since the beginning. Hmm. John, what about the institution you're most familiar with, the law? How, how is racism um, institutionalized in our legal system? Well, you definitely see uh, disparate impact, disparate sentencing, disparate involvement in the criminal justice system generally uh, of minorities, uh, black and, and Latinos and, and other people of color. Um, you know, that that's in Utah, that's across the country. And, you know, there, there are, you know, we are in the process of sort of figuring out the, the data that shows that, but there is no question that, you know, in Utah as across the, as across the country, um, there's a much higher percentage of people of color involved in criminal cases. They get higher sentences. Um, there was a study recently, I think in the Tribune or the, the Tribune analyzed some, some data and showed that, you know, in the juvenile court system that um, you know, diversion programs were less available to people of, to, to youth of color. Um, and, you know, just talking about the, the college, the problem with you, the problem in colleges, that starts much earlier, right? We have, you know, in Utah, again, as across the country, but in Utah, you know, we recently had a study done about the disparate um, involvement of kids of color, students of color as early as elementary, um, you know, facing unequal school discipline and facing rates of having law enforcement at a much higher rate. So, you know, we've been working for, and, and it's, we call it the school to prison pipeline, right? You know, the two problems I'm talking about are actually related because, you know, statistics show that the earlier involvement with the juvenile system or the criminal justice system tends to sort of put you on that path later in your life. And so, you know, we've been working uh, for a long time of trying to figure out exactly why that's happening and how we can change that. So, you know, some of that effort includes proper training for school resource officers. Um, you know, there are certain middle schools in Salt Lake City that have school resource officers and others that don't. And, you know, our concern is certain high schools that do and certain high schools that don't. And, and so, you know, we're very concerned with, with that sort of issue. And so, you know, the problem is that from a very young age, you know, they, people of color are facing systemic hurdles to success. And so that's something that definitely has to change. Um, and, you know, it's, it is heartbreaking to hear that, you know, even in the most, you know, elite institutions, it doesn't stop. So it's a constant struggle. Um, and it's one that you just have to keep on fighting every day. Mm. What about the private sector, James? Um, we've all gone through diversity trainings. We've got, we've been told over and over again that we need to recruit diverse employees. Does institutional racism still seep into the workplace even after all these years of conversations and education? Yeah, absolutely. Um, before I get into that real quick, just to kind of give people uh, a picture of what uh, Saida and Dr. Smith were talking about, there was a movie that came out in the mid 90s called Higher, Higher Learning. And even though it was a fictional story, what the, the role that the actors played is based on experiences that students do face in, you know, at, at college and university regarding racism. Um, so it's a great movie to check out there. Um, but in the private sector, I'll just give you a quick example. I had a call yesterday morning from a, um, a company who was desperately seeking some help as far as their diversity and training. They had a PR nightmare they're trying to deal with because the ex-employee was blasting them because of some, um, um, racial things that happened at, at that company. And, you know, this, they reached out to me trying to gain some insight on how to fix this situation, not only externally with this PR issue, because she has a huge following on social media, this ex-employee, um, but also internally, um, as far as how to move forward for this and learn from this experience and how to be better. 
Um, being in Utah, where it's very homogenous here, as you were stated earlier, you know, trying to find diverse talent gets pretty complicated. And you have to be, you know, re, you know, recruit internally and externally um, in Utah and out of Utah to find diverse talent. And so what we do with the chamber, you know, we connect with so many different nonprofit organizations. You know, Dr. Smith is a member of the Omega Psi Phi fraternity. So, you know, so we reach out to organizations like his and other organizations that have these professionals um, that these companies can be introduced to. So when those positions come up, that they um, know where to seek this, this qualified talent of, with people with diverse backgrounds. But also it's important that you create an inclusive environment within your company. So when people come into these companies, you know, whether black, Hispanic, um, LGBTQ, whatever, that they can bring their full self, that they feel comfortable um, because there is an environment that's welcoming. And that's what we have to focus on when you're doing any type of diversity training. It's not just to train on inclusive language, um, although it's important, you know, unconscious bias training, which is important, but you gotta think about the values that your culture and your company brings to your employees. And that's what's most important than anything, because right now I've been telling people all this week that black folks are not okay right now. So for us to be working from home is probably a good idea because for us to go into a workspace with this tension and anger and frustration, some people may respond pretty well, some people may not and probably would be threatened with their job being not there anymore because of the way they responded. But depending on the values that a company has in place where they can vent a little bit, have a space where they can talk amongst employee resource group or maybe with their diversity officer or coordinator, to kind of express their thoughts and feelings and appreciate that the environment that the company has in place, then that unlocks the potential for um, the, you know, uh, the black employee to continue to thrive and be productive within their company. Um, but yeah, it's still an issue within the private companies right now. And we continue to work to educate the, the, the private companies on you know, diversity training, um, creating an inclusive environment and introduce them to opportunities where they have to expand outside of their normal recruiting um, strategy so they can find the qualified, the diverse talent that's um, not only located outside of Utah, but here too, because there is a lot of talent here that's being missed. Um, people behaving badly, you mentioned uh, a tweet that was completely inappropriate. And, you know, we covered a story, I want to say it's maybe two weeks ago of um, some racist graffiti that appeared at the dugout in um, Orem, Orem High School. Um, so that's kind of big stuff. But also part of this discussion that I'm hearing um, around the protests are microaggressions. Um, uh, Professor Smith, can you just explain what that means? Um, and maybe some of you can chime in on exactly how you've experienced a microaggression. Yeah, well, microaggressions are typically subtle um, indiscretions of stereotypes and maltreatment. So someone could, uh, one of the common things, you could be in a grocery store, pre-COVID now, in a grocery store and you give the cashier your um, money in those days, particularly when they didn't have a little automatic um, change machine. And instead of putting the money in your hand like they would do the customers before you, they would either drop it on the uh, counter or drop it in your hand. Um, so those are little messages of slights, right? So those are micro level uh, aggressions that you just treat it with uh, indignity. And then there are these micro invalidations and, and there are also macro level um, uh, mic macro aggressions, which also are like, um, kind of a group level, um, major aggressions toward people. So George Floyd would be an example of a, a macro aggression or the bombing of the uh, church where the four girls, the black girls got killed would be a macro level aggression. So it's an intimidation, a disrespect, um, hatred toward a community. And that happens right, across all kinds of oppressed groups. So sexuality, uh, race, ethnicity, class, ability. So all these different groups um, can be microaggressed. Are the microaggressions intentional or are they the, typically the result of um, implicit bias? 
Well, some are intentional and some aren't, right? And so the oftentimes the ones that are not intentional are more damaging because we're prepared for the intentional ones. So we did studies where we asked people, we interviewed them, what is it like getting up in the morning? How do you prepare yourself? So oftentimes people of color will leave their homes expecting a certain type of microaggression to occur because they're so used to it in their environment, whether it's in the school, whether it's in their work environment or in their social environments, where it's going to be mixed groups of people, racial groups of people. So they're um, typically ready for those, but it's the ones that you don't expect when you're, you're off guard. So people of color walk around oftentimes on guard, you know, ready to defend against any microaggressions. And that's part of the racial battle fatigue that adds up and wears you out and it, and it has a negative effect psychologically, physiologically, uh, and emotionally. Hmm. John, anything to add on that? You know, one thing that I commonly see is um, if you have a, an accent, people s sort of can start thinking about, you know, they, they, they associate that with inability to, you know, think well, right? I, as if knowing two languages isn't a sign of intelligence, it's somehow a sign that you're not intelligent. Um, you know, that's one that that's a common one that I see because, you know, working with with people who are from all over the world, um, you know, it's unfortunately fairly common that that an accent will um, be look, you know, be a reason that somebody might be apprehensive about somebody or speaking a foreign language and. You know, that's, that's a little bit less so in Utah um, more recently because we are becoming, uh, I don't know if I broke out, um, it's becoming a little less so in Utah because we are becoming more uh, diverse, uh, but, you know, definitely assumptions around language ability is, is something I find very commonly. Yeah. Um, I want to fold in a couple of questions from our viewers. Um, this from Trisha on Facebook. What about more PAL, Police Activity League presence, to help build trust between our Salt Lake City youth and the police officers? Um, I, I'm not sure who to direct this to. Do you think that having um, a, a little bit different presence starting younger would create more of a, a positive relationship, not just between um, you know, citizens and law enforcement, but the other way, law enforcement to the citizens. Um, anyone wanna take that one? I can jump in uh, yeah. because the question was about youth presence and being a, a youth and being a teenager still and having, a, I've had a police presence in my school since elementary school. I know uh, that I've had one in elementary school and middle school and high school. And although there, I've never had a bad experience with my school police officer, I know so many bad experiences that my friends have had. And I personally believe that we're moving towards a, a direction that reform is not happening. It's not happening in the police department. And a lot of other police departments all over the world are, um, and people all over the country are asking for, you know, abolition are asking for defundment. So there is the level that it doesn't matter how much diversity you have in police, or if you give good presence and youth, the relationship has been broken. It's, it was broken 50 years ago. The relationship was never good in the beginning. Um, so I think right now we need to we need to move from this um, kind of dialogue that we can salvage or we can reform when we don't need police in schools when we need counselors. There's not there, I never had I never went to a school where there was a psychologist. I never went to a school where there was a school nurse. I never went to a school where there was a social worker. I never went to a school where there was even a librarian. So why are we going to force more police officers into these schools when we should be using that funding to give art programs, to give after school programs, to give, you know, math leads, to give them the resources that these students in these schools do not have 
why do we need to just push in more police when we know that students of color are the ones getting suspended more students of color are the ones that are going to these police officers offices more students of color are the ones that are um being harassed by these school police officers so i i'm sorry but right now we're at a place where we cannot talking about putting more police officers in these schools or making them train more or making them be more diverse when we've seen it hasn't worked at all uh, this is a very similar comment from Becca on Facebook. What if instead of resource officers, there were more counselors with de-escalation training? Um, that seems to be the sentiment that Saida is expressing. Um, Dr. Smith, thoughts? Uh, I thought Saida was a, a mic drop right there. I don't know if I could add any more. I'm glad my daughter goes to school with her at Berkeley, <laughs> you know, so... Um, I thought she gave a perfect response. And I think one of the things, if I could just add a little bit, is oftentimes we think that the police should come in and give the community something. Really, the community has community cultural wealth. We can give the, the police something. We can teach them. We can teach them about humanity. But foremost, it's about input. So who is who are becoming a police officer? They have to do a better job on the input, just like universities select among the best students um, to admit into their institutions. We if we're going to have a police force and in a modified form, whatever it might look like, it's the input that we have to be concerned about so that races and sexes and homophobes and all these other people are part of that process. As we do the same thing in higher ed, we don't want you as a professor if you're going to be racist and sexist and homophobic and transphobic. So if we can do it and we are struggling to get it right, I think the police also has to take that up. So learn from the community, do things within the community, live within the community so you'll know us and you'll see us as human. But most, most importantly, you should have social justice right at the forefront of your belief system, your values. So you don't come in there abusing people, particularly people who don't look like you. Hmm. John, anything to add? Yeah, I, I, I uh, was out for a second, but I, I do think that this is a good moment to start rethinking about, you know, the idea that police are the answer to a, a lot of the issues that we face um, and re sort of rethinking, uh, you know, whether, you know, somebody in a mental health crisis that, you know, that we should necessarily be calling the police in that situation or somebody who's having a substance abuse crisis, we should necessarily be calling the police in that situation. Um, and, you know, certainly school resource officers, um, you know, I, I know that the, the people that take those positions, you know, generally mean well, but do police really belong in schools all day? Um, so I think that it is, you know, time to, a good time to start thinking about, you know, our approach to different societal issues and whether policing and incarceration are really the best ways to, to address those problems. We are at this very interesting and important moment. Um, you have a microphone now. What do black and brown people want from the white majority in Utah? Uh, James, kick us off. Yeah, I mean, this is what I've been talking to a few um, groups, you know, just this week, you know, because they're wanting to learn how to become a better ally and where to contribute. They want to stand against racism. And, you know, there's so many different ways that they, you know, people can contribute to, you know, if they want to be a, a good ally in during this time. You know, there's so many different black organizations here um, in Utah. You can go to utahblackpages.com. It's a growing directory of organizations and businesses that we're um, gathering right now that people can go out and support and just learn. You know, the more you engage with the diverse community, the more you understand. And I think that's the biggest piece right now is learning is listening to understand instead of listening to respond right we're in this in this big division right now 
Um, and all these walls are built up. And the only way to really break down these walls is that we just need to learn how to listen to each other a whole lot better. And then I think in this situation where a lot of people are learning to try to understand what the black community is going through, it's a perfect opportunity to learn how to listen, to develop the energy, um, because it takes a lot of energy to listen, right? And so it's important that we, you know, they become here and listen, get educated, not only from our experiences, but they can do their homework. You know, there's a lot of things on, on TV right now and on demand that a lot of the, the subscription services are providing. There's books that are being shared all over the place. Some Tribune, you put out something about some books that can be used um, that, that people can go grab and read. And so really get educated, um, you know, become, you know, be, get ingrained within us and learn and understand what we're going through. Um, so you can share your voice and use your, use your influence, your platform to talk to others to have the influence to make change. Hmm. Saida, what do you think? Um, you, what is what are young people? What do young people of color want from the broader white community in Utah? Yeah, um, I think right now young people, especially Black students in Utah and non-students, just want to see it at the table. You know, we just want to be heard and our voices to be listened to. And a lot of the time there's a facade of allyship where people want to put themselves in front um, and claim to be an ally. But right now is the time where we should be centering black voices and centering people of color voices and, you know, taking five steps back so that your fellow um, um, person of color can take seven forward and really making sure that in these institutions, when you're making organizations, when you're um, making boards and when you're making allies, you need to be putting black and brown faces in these boards, in these institutions, giving them more jobs, creating more opportunities, you know? Um, Cause when you look at big companies in Salt Lake City and you look at their roster, you can see the same thing. It's all homogenous. And black people right now are educated. We're smart, we're intelligent, but we're not just given the platforms or the resources to get these big jobs. And once we can kind of get institutions to listen to us and to give us a seat at the table, I think change will come. And if they don't give us a seat at the table, you can see right now that we're making room and we're forcing our way there. Dr. Smith, I have to ask you, what do you think about allyship? Because you know, I ask because I know people of color who completely reject the idea that there is some sort of true ally out there. Yeah, well, with, with allyship, I think one of the problems there is that oftentimes well-meaning white folks want to jump to the front of the line without doing homework. And people of color have been doing this through racial socialization all of our lives. And racial socialization is a process that goes across generations about how as a Latino can I survive in this society that my family has been here 20 generations before the US the border crossed them actually right so they were here so I know people who were here and this was part of Mexico right so what we have to understand is that you have homework to do you have a lot of reading. Do you see all these books behind me? This isn't play. We do a lot of studying, even though we're experiencing these things. I have to also add to what James said. He said, there's value in listening, but there's also, once you listen, you have to believe. And so let me just share some stats with you that I, I pulled up. And there was a, 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 a study done by YouGov and another national paper, I won't mention it, um, on the air. But when they ask these days, uh, do you disagree that these days police in most cities treat blacks as fairly as they treat whites? 31% of whites uh, disagree. 76% of blacks disagree. 65% of Democrats disagree. 35% of independents disagree and 14% of Republicans disagree. So you have 76% of black people saying that we're not treated fairly as whites. And you have whites saying only disagreeing at 31%. So that's a mismatch. So somebody's not paying attention to our experience. 
And so we need you to listen, learn, read, form your own groups. Don't try to jump to the front of the line. Allyship is bestowed. All right. That's the main thing. Allyship is bestowed upon you. You're not, you don't just take it and make it that you're an ally. Hmm. John, anything to add there? Yeah, well, just thinking about, you know, what what I would like. I would like, you know, the people to people in authority, government actors to live up to the promises that we've made to each other in the constitution, right? The constitution uh, from my perspective is a, is a really good roadmap to how the government should treat the people. And if we put that into practice in an equal way, you know, it, you know, we have a lot, there's a lot of potential, but we are not fulfilling those promises in an equal way, right? When, when unreasonable force is used more often against people of color, when students of color are more often referred to law enforcement, that's not the promise that we made to each other. We are supposed to be an equal society. And so I, you know, I think that is hearing voices, treating, treating the stories that you hear seriously and understanding that your experience, you know, as a, as a member of the majority is not the same as the experience of a member of, of, of other people. And understanding that just because that's not your lived experience does not mean that that is not the lived experience of everybody you've heard from today. Mm. I, I want to go back to where we started, which was the protests. And I see the sentiment, you know, some people say, I support police reform. I denounce racism. But gosh, you know, when it crosses into vandalism and looting, that's, that's too much. What would you, if you were confronted with that commenter, what would you say to that person? Um, James? Martin Luther King said that writing is the, is the voice of the unheard. You know, we've been trying to tell people for so long that we're being oppressed. You know, when Dr. King walked across the Selma Bridge, that didn't work. When Colin, Kaep when Colin Kaepernick kneeled, um, during the national anthem, and people directed that as disrespectful to the flag when that wasn't even a purpose, so that didn't work. And so you have these oppressed voices for so long that go unheard, and, all, and then all of a sudden the lid just blows off. And so finally people are starting to listen. Now, we, we don't condone any of the rioting or the vandalism um, that's, that's occurred, but that's just what happens when people are our voices are not being heard for so long that they they scream so loud in order f in to, to get the attention. You think about even the baby, when their voice is not being heard, they scream louder and louder and louder until the voice is heard. And so I think now when we've seen it, that our voice is now being heard with, you know, almost two weeks straight of protests. And for now, in the most part, the protests have now been peaceful, but now we're starting to see some things being um, sent off to, you know, some bills being made, some, you know, voices are now being heard, there's been conversations, I've been in several conversations all this week, and so hopefully, you know, we, we don't come to this level again, and we hope that when we start doing this peaceful protest, people understand it's time for our voices to be heard, and before the lid blows off again. When you say that, though, the lid has been blown off multiple times. Um, is this just another episode of civil unrest along the path to civil rights? Uh, Dr. Smith, what do you think? I don't think we've probably seen the worst of it yet. So it's going to be uh, based on the responses. If we can continue to start to open up this system of systemic racism, systemic sexism, um, systemic homophobia. Once we start dealing with all of these sins of our society and people can start realizing that maybe we are taking a step forward, then I think you will see more and more people starting to join hands and say, okay, this is the society, this is the United States that I can believe in. 
a lot of us don't really believe fully in the United States because of the way the United States has treated us. So I think that's the most important thing is that people will, who really love this country, there's other people who love it, but can't stand it. And so I, that's the crossroads that we're at, that while we love it on one hand, we can't stand it on the other hand because of how she treats us. And we've been um, beat down for so long that now, um, depending on how things turn out, how those officers will be, or ex-officers will be handled with the court, which I don't think three of them will be treated the way we think they should be treated. Then you might see a, a surge again. And that's history has taught us that these type of things will occur. But once we get over that, Hopefully we can get over that mountain into a better society and push America because this is 2020. Now, James brought up Martin Luther King. My father was Martin Luther, one of his bodyguards. So even a peaceful man did not escape violence. And I'm talking about those around him because I know what my father carried <laughs> you know, and what he had to do. So we have to understand that we have to really look at black and brown people and, and we have to say something special about them that after all that's been done, they can still love people and be forgiven. You know, that we haven't just gone crazy or just revolted against everybody in this society and just, we don't want to be around you. We still try to be neighborly. And that's something very spiritual in the essence of black and brown people that we are, we want to forgive, we want to move forward, we want to embrace, but there's so many of us in this country that aren't willing to do that. John, what is what is the next step? Is it a baby step or is it a, a, a big step forward, a leap forward? Um, you know, is, is it defunding the police? Is it um, some other policy action that will actually result in long-term attitude shifts. What, what is your thought on that? Well, you know, I, I do think um, that there are, you know, a lot of good ideas out there. Uh, you know, I've, I've been, you know, our uh, organization has tried to center the, the voice of Black Lives Matter right now and their suggestions for change because, you know, the, the people who are most affected by you know, these practices are the ones that, you know, I think, you know, th their voice should be at the center. So, you know, these big ideas, I think it's a time for big ideas. I think it's a time for thinking outside of the box and, and pushing, pushing big solutions because the problems are certainly very big. Hmm. Saida, I'm going to give you the last word because you are the future. So what do young people want to see results from, from the protests, from demands? Um, you have a seat at the table now. What are you going to do with it? Yeah, um, I think right now the youth have been so mobilized for change. You can see all the big movements right now. The youth are in the forefront of it. Uh, Black Lives Matter, um, March for Our Lives, the Climate March. Youth have become more mobilized and more outgoing about their voices. And this is nothing new. When you look at the past, you look at the climate um, and you think of Vietnam and all the protests, it was youth. And you think of the um, civil rights movement, it was youth that were sitting at the bar stools. It was youth that were rioting. It was youth that were in the voices because we we know that our parents can't risk it. Our parents can't go to jail. Our parents can't lose their jobs, but we can really put our voices out there and make the difference. And I think right now, a lot of youth are calling for defundment. A lot of youth are calling for abolition and me included. And there has been strategic and scientific ways that communities can police themselves and communities can make sure that we're safe. And um, I know that that is a scary thing. And change is scary. You know, when we look at big shifts in America, like the abolition of slavery, I bet no one saw, sat there and thought, maybe this is scary. They all thought that, but people decided to do it. When we think of banishing uh, Jim Crow, it was a huge thing and a lot of people were against it, but people realized that that was the next step. That was the next step that was needed. And right now with the Minnesota Police Department um, saying that they're going to defund, it's been a huge huge wake-up call and a lot of youth are really excited and I think right now is the time 
like John said, to think big, to think outside the box, because our problems are huge. Our problems need youth. Our problems need the older generation to, to hold hands, to come to the table collectively, and to figure out how we're going to make sure Black people don't keep getting killed. That's it. Your enthusiasm is infectious. Saida Dahir, thank you so much. James Jackson III, John Mejia, uh, Professor William Smith, thank you all so much for enriching um, this conversation and lending your experience. Um, your personal stories really mean a lot. Thanks so much. Thank you. thank you for having me. Thanks. Thank you. So we're gonna continue this series next Wednesday with a conversation about police violence and reform within law enforcement. So we hope that you'll join us for that. Uh, for now, this is Trip Talk Town Hall. Thanks so much and be well. <laughs>